Hi, Jimmy here, I'm back again, and today we are inside for two good reasons. Number one, it is hella windy outside, and my mics will pick all of that wind up and make the audio all nasty, and I'm not the best audio-visual editor in the world, so uh, it will be a struggle for me to film outside. And second of all, because we're talking about a very indoor activity today. No, not that one. We're talking about video games. <laughs> We are talking about a video game that some of you guys have asked me several times if I would look at, and we're looking at the Banner Saga. Um, Banner Saga is actually a series of video games, and... How do I describe Banner Saga? It's basically if Final Fantasy had been set in a fictionalised Northern Europe, and if you don't know what Final Fantasy is, imagine the Mabinogion in a sci-fi world with Chocobo. Anyway, Banner Saga is uh, an amazing series of video games. I actually hadn't started playing Banner Saga before I started the channel, and then a few people asked if I would do a video looking at the costumes and some of the material culture of the games, and so I started playing them, and now my heart is in bits. Uh, yeah. But it's a beautiful game. It's actually um, inspired by a number of different cultures from Northern Europe in the early medieval period. So we're going to have a look at some of the clothes, we're going to have a look at some of the, of the kit of the various uh, species and cultures present in the game. Um, the one group we're not going to really look at that much are the dredge, the baddies, the main baddies, um, certainly in the first couple of games, and that's because they are basically an entirely fantastical villain concept. They have a couple of romanizing elements like the square tower shields, um, and there's a couple of other elements of, of things like there's some pure 80s sci-fi elements to them, like the glowing eyes and the very linear shapes and the blockiness of them. Um, and there are some other kind of like um, Neo-Assyrian and Babylonian elements if you really dig into it, but I'm not sure that that's what they were going for. And I'm not sure that the dredge are meant to be like historical, I think they're meant to contrast with the the pseudo historical nature of the rest of the game. So we're not really going to talk about the dredge particularly, um, but for my for my tuppenny worth, they're really cool looking baddies. Like they're a very handsome design. They're a very effective design for a villain in this game. This this dark but also glowing effect that you get from them because they're like very black and very black and white, and they have these glowing eyes and stuff. So uh, they're really cool. But beyond that, there's not a huge amount to look at in terms of what this video is meant to be. So effectively, uh, what we have in Banner Saga is we have this world where the sun has stopped moving, the dredge are the baddies, and you have humans and you have varls, and varls are these kind of giant-like creatures with two great big horns on their heads, and um, they are... These two, like the humans and the varl, are kind of heavily influenced by early medieval Norse and sort of northern European culture. Um, some of the humans that we have are dressed in ways that suggest that they have Celtic influences, so we have certain things like these styles of Penanula brooch and these recurring uh, sort of spiral, Celtic spiral, I've heard these called before, uh, decorative elements on cloaks and on shields. Um, but an awful lot of the humans that we play as and that we meet in the Banner Saga games are obviously meant to be Vikings, like they're obviously meant to be Old Norse people. And for the most part, that's clear enough because uh, we see people wearing both fairly historical looking things like spectacle helms, obviously based on the Guillermo and Boo helmet, and tunics carrying round shields with rims and bosses painted in these geometric uh, styles. We also see, uh, as I mentioned, pinanula brooches, but also tortoise brooches, and the varls tend to wear tortoise brooches. We see a pair of tortoise brooches on a lot of the varl characters. But we do also see humans wearing these and similarly used personal adornments. So Folker wears a pair of penanula brooches with beads strung between them. Um, stringing the beads between two brooches is obviously a very old Norse and generically sort of northern and northeastern European 
thing to do, like stringing a set of beads between two brooches worn at the shoulders um, to help keep your dress up, or for pure decoration, or to keep a cloak up, is a very early medieval women's thing to do. So she does look quite early medieval with her two brooches and her string of beads. Um, the the sort of the the fantasizing elements of her clothes are things like the very short sleeves and the big cowl neck type thing, reminiscent of your man from that series of Vikings. Um, but it takes enough influence from early medieval clothing that it's obvious that she's meant to be a Viking Age Old Norse woman wearing an apron dress, right? Wearing this this very idiosyncratic and culturally identifiable piece of clothing. And we see other things, we see things like cross-gartering on arms. Uh, cross-gartering was practiced in the early medieval period. Some reenactment groups who shall go unnamed um, hate cross-gartering. And they hate it because it was overdone in the 1980s and early 1990s, and they've now taken a very hardline stance against it. But we do have evidence of cross-gartering. It was done in the period. It's a very practical thing to do, because it, it stops your pants, your trouser legs, from flapping and getting in the way of things. And arguably it's a more economical way of doing it than using winning ass or, or vittelbende or puttees or leg wraps or whatever the hell you want to call them because uh, you can just do it with a single piece of, of leather thonging or some string um, and we do see it done on legs on calves and we see it done on forearms and doing it on your forearms is probably slightly less practical uh, and not something that i've seen depicted in historical images and in manuscripts and and illuminations um, but it, it, it does, it looks fun, and it gives some of the tunics a nice fitted sleeve so the arms look nice and nice and muscular, nice and buff. Um, really emphasises how buff your forearms are. The other aspect of the tunics that is a little bit pirate costumey, a little bit Halloween-y, is the neck. So the necklines tend to have these lacing points in them. They have these uh, eyelets, rather, um, and then they're cross-laced. So these laced-up necks on the tunics. They're not something that you see in, in depictions, they're not something that we see in the archaeology. Uh, they're very popular. They do appear later on, but uh, even in the 17th, the 18th and the 19th centuries, you just put a couple of buttons there, or you have a single pair of ties at the top of the shirt, because this is all going to be covered by the various other layers that you're wearing. Um, so this 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 cross lacing at the necks is uh, you know it's a little bit Hollywood. It's a little bit naff, but this isn't set in Viking Age Northern Europe. This is set in a fantasy world. The the Vals have a tendency to wear leather aprons and uh, leather van braces. And the whole leather van brace thing is is very fantasy. Uh, it's very LARP. No shade on LARPers. Um, but it's not something that you really see a lot depicted in actual early medieval, or ever, anywhere, ever, in early medieval sources and archaeology. So it's it's a bit fantasy looking. It does make them all look a little bit like the village blacksmith from a D and D game, uh, which I quite like because it, it kind of it for my when I look at the Vals anyway, I like associate them with power and strength. And so when I see them wearing leather van braces and leather aprons, held up with two brooches and a very very femme style. Um, I see them as like these strong, really built, bearded blacksmith women, which I think is a, like a really fun association that my brain makes. Uh, and it's probably definitely not what Stoic and the studio were trying to do with the game, but I think it's really cool um, that that's where my head goes. Um, in terms of st stuff like other clothes and, and other accessories and things, uh, we have lots of long flowy dresses, lots of princess dresses, um, but also lots of people wearing what are just fairly practical looking um, knee-length tunics, pants and shoes. Uh, lots of people wearing fairly practical ankle-length dresses and headscarves. Generic early, mediev early medieval stuff. In some of the later games you see some of the furry hats based off some of the finds from Birka. Um, they're, they're quite controversial, these hats, and they're quite conjectural. There's no real evidence that they existed in that form. There are lots of cloaks, and I like people wearing cloaks, so the fact that there are lots of people wearing lots of cloaks in these games is excellent. Uh, they were ubiquitous in the early medieval period, and right the way up to the 18th, uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Some of the cloaks are um, held with two brooches, 
Some of the cloaks are held with single brooches at the shoulder, one of which is a really spectacular one that I'm not sure if it's based on an artefact, but it looks like a dagger with a bone handle and gold fittings going through the ring of a penanula brooch, uh, which is a really cool concept as this two-part dagger and ring brooch idea, and it looks beautiful. Like, I would, I would love to own that artefact, a replica of that artefact, if it were to exist. Um, we do have, in the later games, uh, so in Banner Saga 3, there is stuff like uh, party-coloured surcoats, party-coloured later medieval, so high medieval-looking hoods and mantles, and they look good as livery. Um, that style of party-colouring was very popular. The red and yellow is very Scottish, so they kind of look like uh, liveried Scottish royal retainers of some sort in their in their red and yellow. Um, there's there's a lot of fantasizing elements. There's a lot of stuff like tattoos, very fantasy looking face and neck tattoos um, that don't detract from it. That add to this being this kind of uh, sort of northern European influenced Celtic influenced culture. And with the Celtic influence. A place where they've kind of taken it and run with it is with the horseborn, which are centaurs, effectively. And they're dressed quite in a quite a barbarianizing way. They wear like leather scraps as boob tubes and that kind of thing. And they have very like spiked up hair. They look kind of cyberpunk, like the 80s, 90s version of cyberpunk with their like neon spiked hair in some of them. And they have what we might call Celtic names. A lot of their names are Irish. Uh, if you go on the, I think it's the wiki or it's the fandom site for Banner Saga, it states that the Horseborn's names are all Welsh. They're absolutely not Welsh. Welsh doesn't have that many fathers, and it, they're, they're actually all Irish names. Um, the words that they use in Welsh for the Horseborn are Teile and Cantref. Teile in modern Welsh means family, and in early medieval Wales and in medieval Wales, the Teile of a lord was his uh, his bodyguard, his ha literally his house force, T L house force. So his household, his bodyguard, his retinue, and uh, the word cantrev is a division of land, a medieval Welsh division of land, uh, which is basically it translates effectively as cognate with the, the English hundred, the concept of a hundred cantrev, one hundred towns cantrev, a hundred as a division of land. Look it up; it's interesting, and um, or I can make a video on it if that would be interesting to you. Might put you to sleep. So the Horseborn have these Celtic influences. All the weapons are similarly either fairly fantasizing with like big golden spears, or we have fairly generic looking girly medieval stuff like axes, swords, and shields, and knives. And it, it all looks okay. And some people might be a bit disappointed that I'm not like shredding this apart, but there's three big things to remember. One, this isn't a Viking game. This is a Viking Age inspired game. Two, the clothing in it is pretty cool. Like It's objectively a well-designed, beautifully done game. And three, I love these games, and I'm not here to bash them. I really like the Banner Saga games. Um, even stuff like the buildings and the landscapes. Like The buildings have this cosy look to them. When you go into another clan's hall or into a lord's hall, it looks like a cosy, well-lit building that has tapestries on the walls and plenty of seating and a central hearth in a lot of them. And that's missing from a lot of other depictions of the Viking Age, where everything is dark and dingy and miserable. This is a beautiful place with a, you know, a beautiful um, culture that's developed here, and the buildings reflect that. Even though the sun stopped moving in the sky, there's still beauty and colour, and the, the buildings look usable. You know, they look usable. The big doors on some of the halls look like they're designed to allow people to come in holding spears or to ride horses into a village, and um, it, it's been designed well. In the combat, the graphics change slightly, so it's less kind of um, hand-drawn, uh, illustrative artwork, and it becomes this kind of video gamey looking graphics, uh, a, a little bit like the early Final Fantasy games. And... In the combat, a lot of the clothing is toned down and made a little bit more generic and less detailed, and that helps it look more authentically early medieval. A lot of the helmets, you can't tell that they have like extraneous cheek pieces that aren't really based on evidence, or weird ridges that look like a bit of a mishmash of some of the migration era, and um, 
they look a bl little bit more generic, so it makes it look a bit a bit better. It's like you're looking at a reenactment, squinting at it, or looking at it through a distance. Um, this is something that reenactors have clocked onto in the past, where if you're a member of a small society, all of your stuff needs to be top-notch. Stitch count has to be bang on, fabrics have to be perfect, because people are going to come close to you at your living history display, and they're going to literally stitch count, and they're going to look at everything, and they'll see if there's a metal eyelet on your tunic. Um, if you're part of a big society where you've got hundreds of people and you're doing big battles like Waterloo or, or 17th century pike and shot battles, you can get away with leaving your glasses on, for example, because you are three, four hundred metres, five hundred metres over there. People aren't looking at you as an individual living historian. They are looking at this mass of human bodies recreating large movements of units in the field. So they're not going to be able to tell if you've got modern shoelaces, for example, or if you've forgotten to take off your watch, um, or stuff like that. So you get this kind of interesting... Uh, it, yeah, it's kind of an interesting like comparison with historical reenactors in this game, because you get all of this beautifully detailed hand-drawn stuff with the lovely artefacts like that dagger brooch, uh, and like the tattoos that have all been really carefully designed, and then you get like the generic combat graphics. It's really quite cool. Uh, or I find it cool. I think that's a really neat thing. Um, yeah, so generally, generally speaking, Banner Saga is a really cool game. Artistically, it is obviously based on the Viking Age. Um, there is stuff wrong with it if you're looking at it as a Viking Age game, but then the Varls are wrong because they are giants with horns growing out of their heads. And as far as I'm aware, the sun hasn't stopped moving in the sky because that's not how astronomy works. But if you look at it as a game that takes its influences from... Northern Europe in the Viking Age, it does a fantastic job of it. Like, it does a beautiful job of showing different cultures and different species in those different cultures, but you can really clearly see that it isn't just influenced by classic Hollywood Viking movies. Yeah, we've got the lace up tunics and we've got the slightly silly hair and we've got all the cross gartering, but we have also got the really lovely Celtic inspired designs that look like they could have been lifted out of the Book of Duro or the Book of Kells, or the Rigavarch Salter, stuff like that. Uh, the weapon shapes all look pretty decent, and, and the general forms of the jewellery and the material culture corresponds closely enough with actual Viking Age stuff, like the length and shapes of boats' hulls, that it deserves a great deal of credit. So if you haven't been out and played any of the Banner Saga games, I recommend them, because I think they're lovely games, uh, and they're very good games. Um, and if you have played the Banner Saga games, let me know in the comments if you've got any favourite costume or favourite looks from any of the characters. Um, I really do like Falka. I think Falka's great, especially with like the bruise and the broken nose. I think it's such lovely detailing on some of her costume, uh, and I think her beads kind of look like um, they've been they've been dyed with like a copper oxide. Uh, like they look like bone beads that have been dyed that lovely green blue colour. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed this slightly different, um, slightly sort of, you know, having a, having a little different vibe in this video, I think. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you've enjoyed it. Um, if you haven't enjoyed it, keep it to yourself. And uh, if you are interested in supporting the channel, obviously we have the Patreon, we have the coffee down in the description. Thank you very much to all my lovely patrons. Uh, you're all wonderful, and uh, Easy8, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I hope that this was okay for you. <laughs> so, thank you very much indeed once again. Tanatronessa, till the next time. Bye for now, Willem Straw.